Okay, uh, today we're switching gears a little bit, moving uh, into uh, out of astrophysics and into uh, fusion, uh, material science with uh, light sources, biology with light sources, uh, and winding up uh, with a talk on uh, HEP and the future of quantum computing. Uh, to kick us off, we have uh, John Wu, uh, who is uh, going to be telling us about uh, real-time detection and tracking uh, in fusion plasmas. So, John, please take it away. Thank, thanks, Peter. Um, so, my name is John Wu from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, this application is about uh, uh, fusion plasma, but uh, um, I'm personally a, a computer scientist, not a physicist. Uh, so I will be, you know, talking more about uh, the computer science part. Uh, um, but I, I will talk about uh, the physics uh, uh, just uh, uh, just a little bit. Um, so here's the outline. I'm gonna start with a summary, a short version of the talk, uh, effectively, and uh, uh, we'll touch on a few different applications. Uh, um, in addition to this uh, particular uh, fusion example. Um, then I'm going to mention uh, the data and process management work that uh, uh, we actually do uh, that make this process work. And uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, the future uh, extraction algorithms uh, um, that involves a couple interesting tidbits. And then I'm going to talk about the, the fusion uh, application a little bit more. So it's going back to the fusion example. Um, so this, pro this work was funded under a project called ICE. I -C -E -E. Um, it just sounds cool, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, so the, the vision here is to enable real-time collaborative decision making. So, um, you know, many, uh, uh, you know, this is a university campus many times uh, uh, for large experiments uh, like LHC or this fusion uh, reactor, this is actually a case start at Taichung, uh, uh, South Korea. Um, so it's a, for large collaboration like this, often you know, we send uh, some uh, young folks, uh, graduate student or postdoc there, and when they run the device, they often ask for advices from more senior participants, and this is where collaboration comes in. Uh, in this particular case, uh, you know, there are someone actually go there, push the button, set the, set the physical parameters for the experiment. Okay. So the idea is uh, uh, to, see, you know, to make those type of collaborations easy to do. And um, so this, I, this repeats some of the things I've said already. You know, near real-time collaboration in this Fusion example, the Fusion device currently runs only for uh, tens of seconds. Um, the next generation of devices, ITER, that's being built in France, is expected to run uh, for 300 seconds. Um, so, uh, when it runs, after it runs for that, you know, it will take a 10 minute break or a half an hour break. This is where uh, the, the operator on site will seek advice, figure out what to do next. And that's where, uh, what we mean by real time uh, collaboration. Because, uh, it takes a few minutes. If it, if it takes less than a second, then there's no chance for you to call up your advisor and ask for a parameter, right? You, you have to do it right there. But if it's a few minutes, then there is time to do this type of work. Um, of course, uh, you know, as a computer person, I, I, I you know, deal with files, read, writes, and uh, computer programs that has to run. And uh, the process is to how to make all of that work. The, 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 the general approach is to make the, the data management work, make the data go as fast as possible, right? That's the basic process. And uh, we want the, the computer programs that needs to run, uh, run at the right place. And uh, um, for many years, I've been doing work on indexing that's help you to locate the right uh, data record at the right time. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about feature extraction in this particular case. Um, so as a quick summary, in, in terms of data management, um, doing the right thing, that's this blue curve, um, you know, can get you 
a, a few x in terms of uh, uh, just time to prepare the data, get the data to the right place. And uh, I'll get into more detail of this a little bit later, but just kind of a quick summary of uh, um, the, the, re the work we have been doing. And in this particular case, if you just, you know, I do indexing, right? So I talk about indexing. If you just do it naively, and it actually takes more time than just copying the files over, uh, because actually building the index takes time. That's where the time is. Um, if you do it in a, in a better way, that's uh, what this blue line is here, uh, where you use less time. Um, so this is a computer science project. We typically ask, the, you know, we're asked to, to try this on different applications. Uh, Fusion is one example. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, have you know, read about uh, tote marks. They're donut-shaped devices with hot plasma in the middle. And this hot plasma are really, really hot. Um, they're, you know, think of million degrees. Uh, uh, and of course, the outside wall are in room, uh, you know, room temperature. You don't want anything from the million degree whatever that is to touch the wall. And that's one of the, uh, that's one of the things with this uh, uh, called uh, blob. And I guess uh, the blob is kind of indication, you know, the physicists haven't exactly figured out what's the mechanism to cause that. And what really they're worried about is uh, this blob is an indication, if it, if it appears, it indicates the plasma is going to collapse and it's not going to maintain its uh, uh, coherence. So that's one, uh, that's one, pro one thing they are watching out for. The other is it moves around and it's likely, very likely, it's going to hit the wall. And if it hit the wall, it damages the wall, then you know, the, the, device, the wall has to be replaced after that happened a few times. Uh, that usually is a million dollar operation and you know, six months or nine months uh, of downtime for the device. So that's why they're, they're interested in this type of work. And, the second example that we worked on, this was a supercomputing demo uh, from a couple years back. And this is a material science simulation. Uh, they are looking for uh, fractures, cracks in, in the material um, as they grow, as, as this uh, nanostructure grow. Uh, you know, they, want, they want to figure out where the cracks will form or how the cracks will form. And when the cr so this crack detection is done by this, uh, this group of people is from Georgia Tech. Uh, and they were running this uh, simulation in Singapore, and they have very, um, the Singapore Supercomputer Center was happy to let them do this demonstration because they just bought a cross-ocean uh, uh, fiber network, and they want some flashy demonstration. So that, that's partly why this was set up. But it's a nice demonstration. Uh, it does demonstrate crack detection, and it has a nice, you know, have a nice uh, show at the supercomputing floor. Um, for, for people who does uh, high performance computing, supercomputing is a big, uh, big conference and lots of people go there. So it's, it's a high impact uh, um, demonstration. And this is a kind of uh, really different from what we usually deal with. This is a collaborator uh, who works uh, in Stony Brook University. Um, he collects uh, medical images. He, he actually works for medical school over there. And one of the things that they're doing is they're collecting uh, tissue samples and trying to do imaging uh, of the tissue samples. One of the things they need to do, the image is huge. Okay? Um, one of the things they really, really want to do is to be able to uh, swap patients, uh, you know, get the sample, send it to the lab, get the image, you know, have the patient wait for five minutes, then come back to say, is this, uh, is this sample good or there's uh, cancerous uh, uh, cells in the sample? And in order to do image analysis in, in a few minutes, they need a pretty quick turnaround time. That's, that's where this comes in. And uh, um, in this particular case, uh, the idea is uh, there will be large computing facilities somewhere they could make use of. Uh, in this particular case, they're actually using an Oak Ridge uh, uh, computer uh, because part of the collaborators uh, are at Oak Ridge. Um, they can you know, do this image analysis. This is an image analysis application, but because the image is large, they need a lot of computing power to, to get it, uh, have a quick turnaround. And the magic sauce here is we allow them to, to do this work 
progressively without waiting for all the image, without for all the images to be collected, um, and without waiting, uh, with, without putting all the bytes into files because that takes time too. So just a quick review uh, of uh, what I, um, this work is about. We want to have efficient data management, and uh, we want to be able to manage the work process. You know, the, where the computer, uh, where the computer programs run uh, effectively, so um, we can eventually reduce the uh, time to solution. Um, so that's the quick summary, and uh, I probably should say, you know, feel free to ask questions. Uh, um, if you have any. But overall, that's what I'm trying to get at. I'm going to be talking about data management, process management, then you know, some uh, bit of algorithm, and uh, then going back to the Fusion example. Quick question. Yeah. Does, does it, it, since these might be shared central resources, does contention play any problem, have it play any role? contention for access to? So that's one of the things uh, we're working on. Uh, uh, so uh, I guess uh, there is a com supercomputer center up the hill from here uh, that uh, we all use the resource, so their, their work along that line to, to manage that. Right? So, so the big supercomputer resources are often uh, batch scheduled. You have to change that policy. You have to make different arrangements in order to, to enable uh, real-time access. The early demonstrations are typically done with a reserved time slot, you know, that, that type of setup. But uh, in order to make this much more routine, you need policy in place. Uh, you need uh, ways to schedule, schedule real-time jobs, right? So, um, so that's... What about two, let's say, just for the data that you have, two different analysis wanting to work on it at the same time. Do you allow for that, or is it usually just one, one thing going with one set of data? So, so far, we, we, we're, we're doing you know, mostly one task at a time, okay. but the data, the data management engine um, can recognize uh, you are sharing data. So, um, so for example, <coughs> you, if you have... Uh, um, so, the, the, the data in memory data, in a way, is pooled together and it's, it's managed by a, a, a daemon. And if you have multiple tasks, multiple different analysis that tap to either the same part or different part of the data, um, the this, this central uh, uh, daemon could figure things out and ship you only the okay, data you so, need. So, multiple things can, multiple talk, things to can, can okay. talk to the daemon at the same time. So that's the part with you know, the data and process <coughs> management that I'm going to go into uh, a bit next. So the core of this data management system um, especially is called Adios. Um, it's a shorthand for adaptive I.O. systems, but I think most people just know it as Adios. Um, one of the features that we are really making use of here in, in this particular application is uh, it makes it, it unifies data access, uh, uh, you know, for remote and uh, uh, local data access. You know, you can use the same interface. You you can write a program. You can test the program using files on your local laptop, and the same program with a few uh, configuration tweaks, you can send to a supercomputer, and it will connect to the right data. You don't have to change your program. You just need to change the configuration parameters, so it will know where to get the data. Um, so if you write, in a typical program, you open a file, you read the file, those statements, those programming statements in your file, in your program, remains the same. So that's uh, uh, what we mean by unifying the local and remote I.O. accesses. Um, I, unless you're interested, I'm not going to get into the details, but that, I think that's the key point, that you don't need to worry about whether the file is remote or local. Uh, if you use this uh, uh, I.O. system. The second feature that's very important that I already mentioned a little bit is uh, streaming. So you don't have to wait for the whole file to be written in order to start processing data in the file. Um, this is an important feature that allows us to process, you know, in, in case of that big medical image, as soon as a part of the image is finished, uh, you know, generating, 
then that piece of the image could be analyzed. You don't have to wait for the whole uh, 10 gigabyte image to be generated in order to uh, start working. And that's one way we reduce the, uh, the processing or response time. Ah, yeah. Actually, there is an illustration. This particular illustration is, again, from Fusion. Uh, I know it because it says GPI. That's uh, gas puff imaging. It kind of doesn't matter, but it just helped me to remind me that this is a, a, a real example. So if you, if you wait to collect the data, because um, data collection and data transfer takes time, then you start analysis. That's going to take, a, take a, a, a while. In this particular case, it takes about 50 seconds. Um, you, can, you can break this file transfer into pieces, and then you do analysis piece by piece. And that could help your analysis job to finish a lot faster. Right? This is a concept that's uh, uh, it's pretty you know, uh, obvious. Uh, you can do this. And in many cases, this is. Um, so the most successful data management system, the MapReduce system, right? Uh, that, that's the commercial big data. That one of the big things they, they are able to do is this uh, data parallel approach, right? Process one piece of the data at a time. So effectively, this is doing the same thing, processing data uh, one piece at a time. So a question on that in the sense of typically when, when we write out an image, um, you know, we run a checksum on it just to make sure that we've done it properly, uh, that there were no errors in in uh, the I/O. Are is that handled on a chunk by chunk basis? Yes, that will be handled in chunk by chunk basis. Okay. So, so it, it, to get into a little bit of detail of what how how RDO stores the data, RDO stores data in chunks. Actually, most of the I/O systems, uh, file system, uh, file format store data in chunks. So the checksum, the, the local information, like the uh, local statistic, like the mean and max of the values, so they, are, they are done in chunks, one chunk at a time. So um, effectively, that allow you to deal with chunks quite separately from the rest. Question? Yeah. You, you mentioned one of the top level concerns was having some kind of a data model. And I, I sort of think of, you know, like a SQL query, a SQL query on a relational DB. Uh, you know, yes. One, one so of the incremental things is well, you get back instances that satisfy the query, instance by instance, and, and that might be an example of. The, so, so the question is, how much structure is is the, the implicit query here based on? Is it just a blob that's being delivered piece? Uh -huh. So, in, in, so you mentioned uh, in in you know, most of the commercial data seems to be uh, following this. Uh, uh, database approach, right? SQL tables. Um, in most of the scientific data, um, the most common thing is arrays. Um, I, I guess our distinguished physicist, you know, high energy physicists might not agree, but uh, um, in most of the simulation data, uh, like this one, you, you, your data come out as arrays. If you, your image come to us, images could be viewed as arrays, uh, arrays of pixels, right? So, so the most the the basic data format RDOs use, and a, a number of other uh, you know, common scientific data management system use, are arrays. So the, the idea of a chunk would be then uh, a part of an array. So you can think of dividing your array into bounding box, using bounding box grids, right? Then each piece would be a part of that. So you don't lose the global context, and there is eno enough local information for you to work on things. So that's the notion of the structure. That's the notion of this. And yes. That to time series. So so you can do this, you know, then stack them over time. Yes. One other question on the chunks: Do the chunks can they overlap? So technically, they don't overlap. You can store um, uh, ghost zones. Um, that actually is often needed in processing, um, but uh, to just to keep this idea simple, right? Okay. Conceptually, you you do a you know a, a clean division, no overlapping. But if you need to, if you need to have boundaries for processing, uh, that this can be taken care of. I'm just well, okay. I'm just wondering in the case, say, say you have a cancer cell or one of these blobs yeah. that sort of splits a chunk 
Yes. How do you handle that type of analysis? So this is where you have boundary things, right? So, so okay. you, you, need to, you, you do need to take care of the boundaries, yes. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Sort of a variation on that question. So and no sampling involved. I mean, you'll, you'll get... Ah, we... we um, so as, as, as a computer guy, I, I can't sample your data for you, right? If you're, if you're a physicist, you say, I need this, then we take it literally means you mean you need this. Unless you tell us do a random sample, we don't really do a random sample. We, 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 we f if you say, find places where, okay, it's plasma, right? We're talking about hot plasma. Uh, blobs typically means it's hotter than, than the rest. So we'll, we'll you, you tell us what's the definition of hotter, right? So you say, for example, we know exactly what is the temperature would be hot, or what is the momentum that you want to look for. So we will, we will look for those exactly. And that actually sometimes creates uh, challenges. Because, for example, Google can, can bend those rules. You say, I look for, word, uh, I look for supernova, <laughs> you know, type supernova in Google search box. Google has no guarantee that they will return you all the, uh, all the document mentioning supernova, right? But so so we, we, we try to, well, the, the, the design for in our work is to say, if you say you want to search for supernova, we'll, try our, we'll, we'll find all the supernova mentioning instances uh, to you. So no, no sampling. So, um, I see inside uh, an audio system is a transport engine that allow us to work on uh, uh, remote machines. So I, I, uh, just in case this might be unfamiliar, uh, WAN, W-A-N here is, uh, is for wide area network. Okay. So well, we're talking about uh, um, you know, data that's generating in South Korea that's used uh, uh, in, in Georgia, t uh, you know, at Georgia Tech, then get sent to Denver for display. That that sort of uh, uh, distributed uh, processing. Okay, and <clears throat> there are a number of pieces in there. We have indexing, we have compression, then we have other <laughs> transformations to ensure the data only the p only the pieces that you need get to you. Um, and try not to bring up uh, more uh, than necessary. Um, this repeats uh, some of the uh, uh, same ideas, so I'm going to stay uh, r skip this, and that gets into more technical details. I don't know how many people are interested, but, so I'll just show that there, there is actual software behind this that you know somebody needs to write. Um, so in, in, remember we were talking about just getting the interesting data. Okay, so let's say that the 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 red means high temperature. Um, the gray part are the relatively low temperature, they will not be shipped. So the, so the other idea that's shown here is the data gets divided, so into chunks, and only the chunks that have relatively high temperature ones in, then needs to be moved. So this is where the indexing coming in, and uh, the, the, um, the blocking of the data is helpful that you know, reducing the data movement uh, is helping us to reduce the turnaround time in this process. And this is a relatively small image, so we're not, we, we can't get too much gain out of this because it's relatively uh, small. But you, you imagine if you have a much larger uh, uh, thing, you're looking for a relatively small piece, um, you, you can get a lot of gain uh, by doing this indexing. So. The other process that we, I mentioned is uh, uh, you know, try to figure out where is the most appropriate place to run this type of analysis jobs. And this, uh, this uh, slide is uh, talking about that. You, know, you, you have a workflow that might take a few steps, uh, and uh, we have a system that will you know, allow us to place the jobs in the right way. To, to minimize the data movement and uh, minimize the turnaround time. So that's a quick rundown. Uh, I expect you know we don't have too many uh, computer science in the audience, so I'm not getting into a lot of detail in there. Um, so maybe the feature extraction algorithm 
could be slightly more interesting. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the feature extraction algorithm. Uh, so it uh, here. So this uh, on this uh, diagram on the left uh, is a basic process. You know, we 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 get the data. We uh, um, we find cells that are hot, whatever the definition would be, and then we effectively group those cells. Uh, into regions, and this does touch on the part. Uh, so, this part requires the. So, this part are all uh, data parallel or embarrassingly parallel, depending on which term you're more familiar with. Um, so, this part requires uh, coordination. That what Peter was mentioning. If you have a region that's on the boundary of one uh, one chunk. And you need to be connected to another chunk. That's that's why that's this one that requires parallelization. Uh, the parallelization we're doing it, uh, takes advantage of both um, distributed parallel, that's MPI programs, as well as uh, threading. So as well as Open MP. Um, so you can imagine, you know, multiple threading helps in this process. Um, because we, we, we need some uh, uh, amount of processing in this particular step. So I'm not, go let me see, how oh yes, I'm going to actually jump into, so the, the, data, the, the data parallel part, um, you know, whatever the condition is, we, we, we evaluate the condition the user gave us, um, that's uh, reasonably straightforward. Um, what I'm going to do is next is going to explain a little bit about uh, um, the details of how to do this step that requires parallel and requires us to to merge the point solutions into regions of interest. So the, the blob is supposed to be a region in this to, in this uh, 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 toke mark. So just 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 to kind of reiterate, uh, you know, the the conditions we evaluate are reasonably straightforward. Uh, um, like this basic thresholding, uh, we can handle uh, arith arithmetic operations, uh, you know, uh, that type of uh, conditions. Um, we get point solutions, and then the next. Uh, so the, the, the next is uh, to connect the points into regions. So that's what this step is, and that's where it ne uh, we need some parallelization. Uh, there is one point that's interesting here is, uh, um, this maybe is getting into nitty gritty here. Um, so if, you're, if, if, the, if the region you select have, say, um, so n is the total number of points in, in your data set. And uh, the, the volume that you select is V. And what, what is interesting is uh, we have an algorithm that can process all this that's proportional to the surface of the volume rather than actually the volume. And this is uh, partly because we compress, uh, we compress the index of the data. We, uh, so this is, doesn't even in, involve in compressing the data itself, but because we're processing all this in index, using the index. So as long as the index is compressed, uh, we can achieve this uh, uh, pretty nice uh, property. Um, so w if you're interested, we, get, we can get into more of that detail. But I think uh, uh, I'll skip on that, uh, the details and mention a little bit more about uh, uh, connected component labeling. Uh, that's the technique that we use to connect the points into regions in space. Uh, yeah. So you have fast ways of identifying uh, patches, if you will, in this. Yes, we have a fast. We we have fast. And we we. And then you have to connect to them. So actually, we 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 identi So, in most of the storage schemes, you need to linearize your data points. Uh, you know that comes from three D into some in, in, into some linear form, right? We 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 take we try to take advantage of this linearization. So. In, in, mon in many of the physics things or physical things, nearby, uh, nearby things have similar values, right? So, so it's kind of easy to understand. So it's because they're nearby physically, they have similar values. Therefore, they are easy to compress, put together. And that's what we're taking advantage of. Right. So I guess, sorry. Once, once you've done your thresholding, you, you then have to 
um, coalesce things into into a yes. Component. So so and so and so what you're saying is that ah you know nearby things have similar values, so we can we can quickly coalesce after we've done the thresholding. So that part of that is is encoded in this index. Right. So 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 um, this. Uh, so Peter knows I talk about FastBit a lot. So part of this is FastBit has this compression scheme that naturally takes advantage of this property that uh, nearby values are similar. Therefore, they can be coalesced in this indexing representation. So this. Uh, so we, we then if after we do that, so what we get end up is we have a bunch of line segments that's from your mesh representing the space or from you know, line segment from an image that representing things that you're interested in. The next step is to connect those line segments in, into, in, into regions. Okay? So this is what we're talking about uh, uh, the data structure that we use, how, how to, to get to that. And there's uh, uh, crazy names uh, uh, like uh, scan with array-based union find. Uh, we can talk about that in, in detail if you like, but uh, there, there are algorithms that allow you to do this uh, uh, reasonably fast. So the, in this process, you might think the, the easy, the straightforward way is to keep a list, uh, you know, add to the list, you know, those sort of techniques. It turns out that just apply, assigning labels to this line segment is a better way to go. And this actually has a, a long history of research work in this. And that's, what this, that's, that's why this algorithm is called connected component labeling. So you, you label the component rather than actually trying to develop a data structure that put things together. So putting things together requires dynamic memory allocation, moving pointers around. Uh, that, that's expensive. Just assign labels, you only need to change a number. And that's easy. Okay, so, so that I think uh, in, a, in a very uh, high level, uh, that's what's going on. That's why this is uh, connected component labeling, not uh, connected component collection or some other term. So this is a bit more detail of uh, how well this works. Lots of you know, tests and, you know, saying th this uh, works well. I, I think uh, unless you're really interested in the details, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, just say, um, the, so there is this idea of a number of nine segments, the query lines, that's, that's the idea, um, we, uh, versus the number of points. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> getting the, the algorithm to scale proportional to number of lines is, is the goal here. Um, there, are some, there are some theoretical proof that says, uh, excuse me, um, the connected component labeling algorithm, in the worst case, is uh, super linear. And so, so we're trying to say, in reality, it's actually linear. And you know, that's getting a little bit uh, too technical. Um, oh, yeah, this is the illustration of the lines. So we're, we're dealing with torus. So we're not dealing with straightforward lines. We're actually dealing with lines that are uh, circles. Uh, well, they're not even actually circles, they're, they're distorted circles. But this is the illustration. The line we're talking about are, are, are stretches like this. Okay? And uh, the, re the, the, um, the regions that get found through this process are, those, uh, are, are this type of uh, uh, long, skinny uh, shapes in torus. Because um, plasma are moving in, in, the, uh, in the torus in this uh, uh, direction. So, so most of the features have that uh, look to it. Um, where we can do this labeling fast, that's uh, uh, not too surprising. Uh, so we're talking about the plasma physics, how to find uh, those uh, fusion blobs. And uh, what this shows is the this parallel algorithm scales, reason scales quite well. Okay. So this, this is a strong scaling. Of course, we need to start with a larger problem. So just in case you're reading the labels uh, on one process, this is, used, this is slightly smaller. This is a weak scaling. Uh, this is strong scaling. We need to start with a slightly larger problem. 
uh, but in general it scales quite well. Uh, one important thing we're very happy with is uh, we're able to get this down to about a, you know a, a couple um, so a couple milliseconds. That, that's 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 a good goal to to achieve because uh, 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 this particular imaging device. Um, well, I guess I haven't mentioned this yet. Uh, this is particular image device it is uh, operating at uh, uh, something like a uh, uh, couple of milliseconds. You know, it takes a picture every couple of milliseconds. If we want to keep up, we need to have a turnaround time that's um, not uh, bigger than that. Okay. So it works. Uh, so that point is to show it works well in parallel, and you know, we can actually get it. Uh, uh, as fast as the image device could operate. So I'm going to go back to talk about the fusion uh, examples a bit more. And uh, so this may be a time for me to pause a little bit, just in case you're interested in the co connected component labeling and parallelization techniques. Uh, just a question for, so taking so I assume this was on the current, uh, one of the current um, devices. Are, are they getting faster or larger in the next generation? So they're getting, they're getting larger. Um, so getting slightly, getting the larger image is not a problem. The problem is in this particular fusion example, uh, they're, they're getting the image, the number of pixels of that imaging device is increasing but it's not increasing to be a problem because okay. they're, they're still only talking about a, a couple hundred by a couple hundred um, per image. But the, 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 the rate it's taking the picture, that's challenging to a, to a lot of processing algorithms. Um, I like that the, Im, and the medical imaging example where they, they take very high resolution image, they, they scan, but they scan one little piece of you know, your, your, your sample at a time, right? So that's where we can deal, can do this in pieces. This one is a relatively small image, but fairly high frequency. Yeah. In, in terms of, so I'm assuming that the, the labeling process, is there structure on the label or is there, is there relabeling that goes on as, 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 ah. as there's a coalescence or is there a sort of a, a, a data, a metadata structure on the labels that, that grows so, up to indicate the, the coalescing? To keep things simple, we, 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 we use integer labels. And uh, when, when two things that were initially labeled differently and later found to should have the same label, the, the smaller label is always used. That is important because that simplifies the logic of programming. Because if you have to make complicated decisions like how many have, you know, say, say you, you decide you want to keep the label that's, uh, that has more elements, right? Then you have to go examine and, you know, all the elements and count how many. The decision of always use a smaller label is a much easier thing because you can just look at the two numbers and uh, take the smaller one, right? So, so there, there are a couple of uh, simple tricks like this to, to, to simplify the process. And, but there are no, no, say, global criteria about the number of connected, the number of regions. You, you might wind up with? Uh, no, because uh, however many connected regions you, you find is the connected regions you find, right? So it's, so it's locally driven. It's, yes, so it's driven by the data. Um, of course, there, there are criteria uh, like if you find a region that only has two cells, you, you drop it because it's too small, it's not interesting, right? There, there may be criteria like that, but that comes later. Right. So we, we label the, everything first. Or, you know, in, in this sort of the data, is, you can imagine the camera is pretty noisy, right? If you get one pixel of something, it's probably not interesting. So, so the, but that comes later. We, we don't uh, uh, deal with that in the labeling process. So in the labeling process, we just want to, we want to go as fast as we can. So here's a bit more detail about that fusion example. The, um, uh, so 
there, this is this is uh, ex experimental data. The simulation data could be, have a much larger volume and uh, could generate a lot more. Uh, in, uh, could be more troublesome if they want, because um, this simulation is a, a particle in cell simulation, which means they track particles through magnetic field, and they they often can can stress the supercomputers just by putting in more more particles. And I, I, we have worked with people who put uh, you know, 10 trillion particles in their simulation. You know, the, the one, one, time, one snapshot of that uh, uh, would be hundreds of terabytes. So, so they, they could definitely, the simulations could definitely stretch uh, uh, any machine, but this is more talking about uh, the experiment. And the other interesting thing that we, we're working on is uh, uh, if, uh, if you see a particular behavior in the experiment, how quickly can you either look up similar features in the simulation or spawn up a simulation that could you know, have similar conditions that can tell you uh, how frequently is that particular feature? Uh, you know, happening. So, so the, the, there's uh, um, intercomparisons that you know it's uh, it's even more challenging. Uh, so, the the fusion plasma looks like this. The jacket age comes out uh, because the um, this is actually uh, it's actually torus, right? We 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 there are cells that we don't care that they're not uh, uh, they're not drawn and. Uh, the edge, uh, the the edge. Well, there's this triangulated device. That's why you you see triangles at the edge. Uh, uh, it's not a mistake. It's just the data outside that we we don't track of. Um, you can imagine the red parts are the blobs, and uh, the white dots in here. I'm not sure whether it's visible to you. Uh, those are the points that we initially identify, that are that has the conditions that uh, we like. Or, um, so the regions are outlined with this red line, and that's after you do this connected component labeling and identify those regions. One of the important tasks is uh, uh, this is diff this is a different part from a different snapshot of a same time step because it's a torus, right? So we're we're looking at the four different cross sections of this, and. One of the things that is interesting is, remember we're talking about we don't want this plasma to hit the wall, and that means we need to track, uh, we need to track those blobs and see how, well, how much they're moving, and then predict whether the, the movement is going to anticipate to take this particular blob to the wall. That, that's uh, um, no, the next step that in this process. Excuse me. In the cross sections, where is the wall? Ah, so the wall is uh, the so the wall is out here. So if you look at this image, the wall is out here. So we're we're not simulating the wall. We're simulating inside the wall where the where the hot plasma is. Um, so the wall is 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 out here. Okay. And we're we're looking. This is. You've sliced the donut. So if it was slice the donut, yes. So we're looking at one circle, you know, okay. this uh, uh, small circle, and actually we're looking only at. Uh, uh, let me see. Do I have a good way to get to the whole donut picture? Um. Oh, that's way. Uh, that's all right. Let me go yes. all the way back. Sorry. So if, if no, no, that's all right. It's good to, to explain this. I think I have time. I don't have too many more slides. Uh, so what we are really simulating is is near here, near the near the uh, f the outside, because um, really close to the center of the circle, nothing interesting happens. Well, well, if something happens there, it will take a long time for it to propagate to outside. So what is really critical is look at almost next to the edge. Um, so what that picture showing you is, ah, so this is a good example. So there is a black line here um, that's called separatrix. So the, the, the critical part we're, we're simulating is fairly close to the separatrix. And uh, um, 
So you can see this black line here. Yes. So this is the plasma developing. If the plasma is developing and it's moving outside, that is, that's, that's troublesome. So, um, so we need to, uh, so effectively what we're doing, after we that do, do the connected component labeling, we can get, gather all the cells together, then we can figure out where is the center, then we can track uh, how the center are, uh, is moving, and based on the trajectory, then we can do some simple predictions. So the predictions, you know, that we're doing right now, it's really simple, it, you know, uh, definitely has to be verified by the physicist. We can't claim we're doing uh, that part uh, uh, in any uh, meaningful way just yet. So this is a big, uh, this effort involves a number of people, and this is, uh, ah, so this is the actual, phys uh, actual image from, uh, from the physical device. Um, this is a kind of a, a, a schematic diagram of uh, uh, how this uh, uh, is being processed. Um, the data comes from K-Star. Um, they, so it's a fusion, it's a, it's a first, it's the first fully superconducting torque mark. And so uh, the Korean, South Korean government involved, you know, invested quite a lot of money in this. Uh, uh, KISTI is their data center, so a lot of processing happens uh, uh, at KISTI. And uh, uh, the, the, the movie like this are produced uh, by you know, a collaborators. Uh, uh, POSTEC is a Korean university. Um, of course, PPPL is uh, one of the premier institutes involved in plasma physics that we work with. Uh, uh, they help us uh, with uh, this type of images. Ah, so um, this is an illustration of. Uh, ah, so this is the illustration of uh, the 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 intercomparison between uh, real uh, the experimental image, which is uh, shown to the left and the simulation uh, uh, image. And you can see, you know, generally they, 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 they go up and down, which means they're, they're in this, uh, um, the, in the radial direction. They're not moving toward the, uh, toward the wall. And the distribution of uh, the, the radial movement is, is about the same. And so they're, they're able to replicate uh, uh, simulation, a real experiment, you know, to to the extent where the radial velocity distribution is about the same, and we can um, this this uh, so this obviously has um, can be typically this can be run a lot faster because this involves a lot larger data, takes a bit more time uh, to do, and we're working on techniques that allow them to be done at the same time. Just as, just as a summary, um, we're dealing with a lot of data to get to, to get to the data quickly. One of the central things that we're doing is to organize data correctly and uh, index data when the data is generated. Because often, because the process of generating the index often is expensive and people don't want to uh, take the all of the data back out again just to generate the index. So generating index uh, uh, right when the data is generated is uh, important. Um, so there, uh, we're process, try, you know, uh, understanding the trade-offs uh, between uh, how fast we can process and how much data we can get in. in that that uh, is another part of the study. Um, reduce the volume of the data by you know, having this index tell, uh, tell you where the data is. So, you know, that's one way to reduce the data. The, of course, also there's compression. Uh, Adios is introducing compression, and we are also working on different ways to do compression. One of the things that's uh, actually quite interesting is we're developing a statistics-based compression technique. Um, 
that actually you know works quite well in in situations like this where you have uh, um, intrinsically there is a certain amount of randomness in the data uh, that uh, uh, statistical uh, feature extraction can can work uh, for compression. Um, I guess ultimately, you know, this work is to demonstrate we have computer science techniques that enable scientists to do distributed uh, data analysis uh, in near real time. And so the, the fusion example is what I talked here. Um, and, uh, you know, other people I, I mentioned, you know, uh, talked of, uh, have medical image and have other things that are uh, using this line of technique as well. So that's uh, what I have, and here are the name of the authors involved, and uh, even the uh, URL to the paper, and there's uh, e my email, and uh, this uh, is uh, my research group's uh, website if you're interested. Uh, thanks. Uh, we have time for a few more questions. So. Don, I wanted to revisit one of the topics that was sort of already uh, discussed in the questions. That was the uh, matching between the um, streaming buffer sizes and uh, sort of uh, what one might call the uh, analyzable chunks that uh, you, that, in, that occur in the data. So, you know, you said that you have to take care of the events, but or the uh, edges. But uh, um, if you've got a indexed file on disk, you can actually, you know, count that. And every index points to something, right? But if you've got an index that comes, uh, uh, you know, in the early part of the metadata for a data stream, and, and you know, might point to data which will be coming later, how do you? I mean, are there techniques that that uh, are sort of um, generic or recurring that uh, allow you to, to to sort of match the the analysis chunks with the the buffer sizes that are coming through? So far, we have been dealing with relatively straightforward cases that uh, we know how to deal with. I'm, you might be thinking of some cases that uh, probably require a bit more thinking. Um, so, uh, we, I was actually hoping you'd done the thing. <laughs> so one of the things uh, that, uh, um, that is uh, that is uh, uh, always necessary, you know, you, you need certain amount of metadata, right? So, so those metadata, you cannot skip on that. So um, some of this processing, like only sending the interesting pieces uh, um, from the data source to the analysis engine, uh, that means the, some, am some amount of the filtering Need information needs to pass from the analysis engine to the center, right? So you so you can do the filtering at the at the source. So um, for example, if you want only the data with temperature between 800 and 1,000, then that that filter needs to be sent to the the source, right? Because otherwise the source has no 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 choice but to send you everything. So, so that's um, this is this is this view is kind of flat, right? You, you for example, you could be talking about uh, you only want time step uh, five and ten, and you don't care about any time steps in between. That type of inf information also needs to be uh, to be sent to the um, to the source. So the so the data source could be aware of this and not blindly trying to send you all the time steps. Uh, uh. The question on the compression that you're looking at, is it lossy or lossless? It's lossy. Okay. So, so yes, so I, we're aware some of the people might not like lossy compression, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but you just tune it to the level at which the scientists can deal with it. Yeah, so that, that's one way to, to make it work. So you, you can, so this is, this, is, uh, this is a new work, a more recent work. Uh, yeah. so, uh, Any other questions? All right, let's thank John again, and uh, we have a break reconvene at 11. Thanks. Thank you.